Well, good morning everybody. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank the, well, the organizers for asking me to moderate this session uh, because we have a very distinguished panel this morning uh, to discuss the topic of education in the new Malaysia. You have all your CVs in the notes uh, handed up to you, so I would not want to go through that. But I just want to mention that education is actually one of the most discussed topics, especially in the new Malaysia, uh, where there are great hopes and expectations for the future. You know, academia or the business community, uh, even the uh, uh, NGOs, government, and even within families, individual families themselves, they talk about education and what has, has to be done, and everybody has their own opinion. But today, we are fortunate to say that we have such a distinguished panel, a panel of experts who give us a variety of views. I think with the new government, one of the major changes made, of course, was the merging back of the Ministry of Education to the Ministry of Higher Education. And then this would then give the minister a much more seamless approach to the whole topic of education from kindergarten, K-12, all the way to, of course, higher education. And this is necessary because the output of the K-12 system becomes the input uh, to the higher education uh, at the universities and colleges. Well, all of us know there are many challenges facing the education system in this country and uh, we look forward to the discussions afterwards. I mean, we talk about the rankings of the country in terms of PISA teams and we also talk about the unemployment uh, situation of the graduates in the country where uh, in uh, 2004 it was about 4,500 graduates, then in 2008 it went to about uh, 57,000, and of course by 2016 the figure has jumped to about 130,000. This is a growing problem, and what can be done perhaps we could be touched on uh, in the course of the day. So we are told to go by a Davos style of uh, discussion whereby each will speak for about eight minutes and then thereafter uh, we have questions and answers. And we are very fortunate today uh, that we have, for example, Dr. Peter Ng who is talking about a case of endowment uh, in the universities and higher education so that it could be a sustainable basis. And of course, Dr. Noah Azima from Page you know, uh, she will talk about the current challenges that we have and uh, what are some of the reforms that are necessary. And of course, Professor Dr. 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 Omar, uh, he will talk about how education evolves to meet the need of society, especially in a new Malaysia. And uh, Dr. Uh, Ahmad Rafie will be talking about the Ministry of Education's uh, efforts, uh, both in terms of inclusive education, as I will also touch on STEM. Professor Dauti will also contribute his views on how foreign universities can help in our education system. And we we'll close off uh, with some remarks from Senator Yusmani Yusuf on uh, education and how it ties into democracy and the role of law and of course the country's development. So to start off, I'd like to ask Dr. Peter Ng UCSI to please talk about this subject right here. Thank you, thanks Sri. Um, I know it's the whole style, but I need uh, my chart um, to illustrate my point. This morning, I, I would like to present a very easy case. Um, the landscape of the uh, private higher education institution um, so that you are aware of uh, where we are as um, education providers in this country. Um, do I just click? Okay, thank you. I think it's easy if I just turn this way, I can see much bigger here. As you can see here, this is um, the current situation of uh, where uh, the, how the public higher education institutions are doing, okay? This is a research done by Professor Dr. Jeffrey Williams. 
and this is only done in 2018. And uh, have a look at this. Before tax, 53% of public higher education institutions what make losses. This is quite contrary to what you think, that these people are making huge money, you know. Everybody is jumping into the bandwagon, I'm telling you, that is not the case. If you, in case anyone of you here is thinking of setting up another institution, or you're buying another institution, I want you to know that 54% of them fell, all right, in terms of average profits since 2010. So that is more than half of them are all going downward. That is the trajectory, okay? After tax, it's even worse, right? And we have our government to thank for. They don't give us money, but they take money away from us in terms of education, providing education in this country. So we have 55% of them actually are making losses after tax. And 78% of them are actually going downward in terms of profit making or uh, in terms of losses, okay? Since 2010. Other growing trends, this is in the horizon. And this is, this is happening. 44% of all higher education institutions are technically insolvent. This is, this is real data, okay? Primary data, not secondary data, okay? So, 44% of them are insolvent, and 64% uh, of them are actually in debt distress. In other words, they are talking about negative equity. That's how bad we are. All right? <coughs> Let me move on. Now, have a look at this model that I'd like to propose. And I've actually submitted this to the um, Ministry of Finance twice, and they rejected me. All right? And I think this is the way forward if we want to really make private um, education institutions sound and the issue about insolvency and so forth. This is the solution. Now, have a look at Stanford uh, model, a huge university of this stature, and yet they require 1.2 billion help or assistance from their endowment fund. And 1.2 billion is what they need from the endowment fund, and that, of course, represent only 22% of their operate, uh, operating expenses uh, for 2017. Look at 1.2 billion. Look at how much that will help a university. It helps 18 institutes of research for this university. 18 institutes. 16,400 students in terms of student aid. 2,200 faculty members benefited seven schools benefited, and 67 varsity and club teams. Now imagine this Stanford University with that kind of stature. Without this 1.2 billion, what would happen to, to this university? Isn't it the same as us, insolvent? Right? Negative equity? Isn't it the same? So don't kid ourselves, probably. Institutions. You think you can collect tuition fees forever and make the profit? No, we need this kind of endowment fund. We need it. And our government till now is still not listening. And I'm going to submit my third application. After several talks like this, I hope news will get to them that we need this kind of endowment policy and that they will approve the next round. Right? And this is the way to go. If we really want to, uh, to make it, if we want ourselves to be solvent, right? So let me move on. Oh, sorry. Now, have a look at percentage of expenses that are covered by endowment in some of these top universities. Look at Stanford. Stanford is one of the lowest. 22% are covered. Yale, a whooping 35%. Harvard, 38%, Princeton, 67%. Without endowment, what would have happened to these universities? And these are huge statues to contend with. All right? So that's the situation. 
Now, of course, they have this kind of investment policy, so I don't have time, we really should not talk into it. And this is the portfolio, how they invest their money, and so forth and so forth. Now, why should the endowment model be implemented in Malaysia? Well, the private universities has contrib contributed so much. We are now um, among the seventh of the eight largest um, country in terms of receiving uh, international students. We couldn't have arrived to where we are in this position today if it is not for the contributions of all these um, private higher education institutions. All these international students were accommodated for years, for more than a decade, only basically at the private higher education um, institutions. But now, of course, the public universities are also uh, getting into the game in a big way. Um, obviously, with funding from endowment um, policy, it will help to make access, uh, university access, uh, plentiful to students that are deserving, not just uh, nationally but internationally. Um, in terms of recognitions at the international level, the higher, private higher education institutions has done uh, very well in the. In the 2019 QS World University ranking, a number of these private higher education institutions outperformed the public universities. I'm sure you have read yourself, okay, my last two points. Three private universities uh, were in Malaysia's top ten, and one joined Malaysia's five research universities in the top 500. Okay, and my last slide. And um, in terms of uh, uh, making their um, they are, they are put that in foreign universities. Many of these public universities are working with Harvard, Imperial, uh, University of Chicago, Tsinghua, and so forth. All right? And uh, let's need to talk more. So we deserve, we need this private, uh, this endowment uh, fund policy. And I hope the government will look into this and allow this uh, to happen amongst the private higher education institutions. Thank you. Sorry, the, the, the bell is to give two minutes. So you, you've got one minute. You know? So if there are any other points that you want to ask for the remaining one minute, good. Thank you. That was a good, quick uh, uh, expose on how uh, private universities uh, need the funding. And of course, for any endowment fund to, to be set up, we also need the ecosystem for the tax incentives and for the people to donate to this endowment fund and of course the government if possible uh, some assistance as well. Can I claim back my one minute? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, uh, why endowment policy? Because the current existing um, trust uh, form uh, is impossible for us to build fund. If you uh, get, say for example, a donation for uh, one million, the current policy is that you must spend 50% of that, you cannot keep everything to build your fund. That's no way to go for endowment policy. So we need to have a new model. We need fund, Ministry of Finance to come up with a new model whereby this endowment fund can be built out over a much shorter period. Thank you. Good point. Good point. Thank you. <coughs> uh, next, Tatin Azima. Mm -hmm. Good morning, uh, everybody. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Um, now, um, what is education in New Malaysia? Education in New Malaysia is one without money. <laughs> Let's face the facts. We were given education, the education ministry was given a budget of 60 billion um, at the last budget, that was in October. Since then, we realized we, that um, we are bailing out Felda, Kapuhanji, Kork, Goldman Sachs. <laughs> so, what else have we got left? Of that 60 billion, over 80% uh, goes to teachers, lounges, salaries, emoluments. So, what really is left um, for the children? Um, just to clarify also, um, while I sit on the National Education Advisory Council, 
Um, there's also the um, Jatang Kwasa Dasa Pendidikan Negara. Just to add some clarification, the um, National Education Affairs Council is actually um, provided for in the Education Act, where we um, sit on the council for two years. So this started in August last year and will be around for, for that short term. The DASA is actually uh, another group of 13 individuals who were um, established by the cabinet in July last year. And that term is for six months. So their um, recommendations to the minister will be made on the 30th of April. And I suppose this will be shared with the public. So, um, and as part of the NEAC or NPPK, um, Tan Sri Yong is the chairman, Dr. Sanghina, who is a member behind there. Um, and, and I and uh, the total 11 of us, we're not supposed to share what we're doing with the public yet. So any recommendations coming out from us will be either through the minister or the prime minister. Um, so I can't share anything with you. <laughs> So that's the end of my speech. <laughs> so anyway, so what page, um, we've been around for 10 years, what we have taken to the table is that um, we are happy that the new Minister of Education has endorsed the blueprint because imagine trying to do another blueprint will take another two years and a lot of money. So what we have been, um, what we have continued to advocate um, bringing pages presence into the council is that uh, we would like to see um, English proficiency being improved. Um, unfortunately, they're still lacking close to 2,000 English language teachers. Uh, not to forget the English teachers who are retiring, which amount to almost a thousand a year. So how will we ever close that gap? So I think unless the government comes to say that we have a national crisis, it's very difficult to, to bridge that gap. We have been saying that let's look at English medium schools, not as we know it to be in the past, but English medium schools um, in every state, or maybe states with least resistance, um, where we can produce our English language teachers. Because if we keep thinking that a Malay medium system is going to produce English teachers, it's not going to happen. We have been dreaming all these years. You know, so we have to come up with a new model as far as English is concerned. The other thing we have been pushing for is, um, of course, STEM English. And now it's stream, but it doesn't matter. You, know, you still have your Doctors, doctors can still come out of the national school system. Um, but along the way, we discovered that um, one of the targets of the ministry as far as STEM is concerned, we wanted all our science labs to be uh, in operating condition by 2019. Unfortunately, um, along the way, we discovered there was a lot of siphoning of funds, uh, you know, by certain persons. So we are into 2019. Um, I think we have yet, if anything, to equip the science labs. So until the science labs are equipped, we can't move forward. And the idea of bringing in the science um, lab test into SEM isn't going to materialize until we get the science labs in working condition unfortunately. And then we've also been pushing for inquiry-based science education, which was piloted um, by academic science with Ministry of Education. We hope that you know, the STEM teachers can be scaled up and given this expertise so that children will enjoy uh, doing science, and children should enjoy doing, doing science if we allow them, uh, you know, we show the right way to do science. So, um, unfortunately, I think the target was to have 270,000 um, students in STEM, in the science stream. 
But our numbers are actually falling. We had 2,000, 203,000 students in 2012. And it fell to 180,000 students in 2017. So, you know, until we, we, we do things differently, we're not going to see the numbers increase. I think the other thing that we've also been uh, pursuing is we're very concerned of the way Islamic studies is being taught in schools. Um, we, we think that it is the delivery of the curriculum which needs to be tweaked. And even last night there was uh, an article in Nesir Kini, I believe, of a single parent who was saying that she doesn't understand why the Ustaza is telling the child that it's alright to stone um, people if you, you know, if you ask if you if you deviate from 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 the norm and the fact that the child asked why one has to stone, the kid was ostracized by the teacher and by the his 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 friends. So I believe this is not the way to go. Um, you know, and also I I I I will also say maybe can can we even do without Pandidikan Moro? Let's think of something else. Uh, you know, so um, these are the three things uh, we have taken to the table, and, and 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 not surprisingly, also this is what the prime minister himself uh, has been saying. Um, he, I think he also forgets that he's not an education minister, but we like it, we like where he is. So um, I think uh, I, I I think my time is up. Thank you. wide ranging uh, uh, knowledge of the things that's happening in the schools and I'm sure during question time uh, some of you may want to pick up uh, one or two of those points. We now move to uh, Tan Sri Dr. Omar uh, and he's going to talk on a, on, a, on a higher level on what it means uh, for education to meet the needs of society as we go to the new Malaysia. Tan Sri. Thank you. Good morning, uh, everyone. I have prepared a, a set of PowerPoints, but I was told not to use them. So you just have to listen to what I have to say. I want to go back uh, to this, uh, to the principle that uh, education evolves to meet the need of society. And what would be the need of the new Malaysian society? Now, uh, to put that, uh, uh, to put it another way, the education is, must be to nurture and develop educated citizens that can deliver the need of society, which is actually national vision or national aspiration. The new government has not come up with. Uh, an articulated national aspiration, but if we look at uh, the previous one, Rukun Nagara, for example, Vision 2020, or even TN50, the short wave TN50, you can summarize that the national aspiration is for a harmonious, prosperous, and progressive Malaysia. And now, with SDG, we need to add sustainable. So I thought new education or education for new Malaysia should be for a prosperous, for a harmonious, prosperous, progressive and sustainable Malaysia. Now what are the requirements for that? So let us look at first of all the requirement for harmony. I think uh, the minister's speech this morning uh, emphasizes very much on the need for unity, and unity of course results with harmony, social harmony. And of course the first part about being a, a requirement for national for, for harmony is what I call the social, cultural and spiritual component, which is based 
put on the principle of smart partnership, respect, trust, transparency, tolerance, and accommodation. The basis for working together, understanding and respecting each other, and living together. That is the first component of harmony. But for sustained harmony, you need to deal with more than that. You need to meet the basic needs of the population. The basic needs will be food, water, shelter, basic education, primary health care, energy, gainful employment. That's the first part. The next part is, of course, improving your quality of life. A very higher level of basic needs. So, it is about nutritious food, clean water, improved health care, quality education, gender equality, and sustainable practices. That is the requirement for harmony. What, we, what would be the requirement for prosperity? The requirement for prosperity will cost gainful, gainful employment, equitable income distribution derived from a robust high income innovation driven private sector led economy. That was the tagline of the previous government. And I think it should remain the same. Innovation driven, private sector led, high income in the economy. What is the requirement for pro progressive? I just put it this way. Being an active part of the present, an influential part of the future on the global stage, not just Jago Campo, and being future aware and future ready. Now, requirement for sustainability is about awareness, comprehension, commitment, and action. Actionable, sustainable practices, the ACCA. And the overall requirement is, is that good governance and responsible government. And the, and the critical technologies to support all that. Technologies for meeting basic needs, technologies for, for improving quality of life, technologies for economic growth, technologies for good governance and sustainability. Now, what, be, what would be the implication on education for those if you want to achieve a harmonious, prosperous, progressive, and sustainable place? There are, you, you would need a, a combination of hard skills and soft skills and the humanities. There are an example of an emphasis on the soft skill. For example, the five minds of the future of Howard Gardner in his book 2007. And these are the discipline, synthesizing, creative, and less respectful and ethical mind. <coughs> then there is, of course, the four C's. We all know about that. Critical thinking, creativity, communication, and collaboration. Those are all just the soft skills. But without the hard skill, the core competency, you cannot achieve what you want. So our education blueprint has got six student attributes, which include both the soft and the hard skill. I want to propose a seven C's uh, of, of framework for new Malaysia. And these are critical thinking, core competency, creativity, communication, collaboration, civility and compassion, and civic nationalism. Without those, harmony, unity cannot be achieved. And that needs to be included. You don't have to do all that in a formal, in a formal way. You can use the informal and even the, the, the non-formal and even the, in, the formal way to, to, to be dealing with. Now, civility and compassion and civic nationalism are important elements and this is what uh, the minister has been saying and that's what Harmony Musra song uh, from Dr. Halima this morning and this is what the dialogue by the National, Co National Cohesion and Unity uh, which I have been involved to promote and the National Di Dialogue Raya is actually to promote a Harmony Musra Malaysian community. Now, the requirement in education is, of course, an integrated uh, curriculum. And this is where I stand 
uh, is being talked about because there's the there the American system for integration. In this country, we are, the Minister has, of Education has talked about stream. Also, a, a combination of hard and soft skills and the humanities and integrated manner. But integration is only one component. The delivery of that integration is very, very important. It's where the inquiry based uh, system of, of learning is, is very, very important. Are we prepared for that? I know uh, my colleague will be talking about that. But uh, integrated system of curriculum is one thing. The delivery must be important. And the people to deliver is important. So what is required for the new educate for education in Malaysia, new Malaysia is a look at the education system, a revamping a new way of, of approaching re selection and retraining and reward for teachers. This is something that I think uh, uh, that is very much required, and that cannot be done in one go. It has to be done in pieces. So my point for New Malaysia is an education for a harmonious, prosperous, progressive, and sustainable Malaysia. I want to emphasize progressive again. Don't let people push the nation back into the case. We need to look into the future. We have to be future, future aware, and we have to be future ready. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Prof. Omar. I think he has touched on many things that Tatin Azima uh, has spoken about. The uh, question of uh, uh, this question of, and he also talked about the harmony, and he touched about global competitiveness, gainful employment, and uh, don't go backwards to the cave, go forward. And I think these are things again we would want to, to talk about as we go ahead. Now, next one would be uh, on the question of the down right at the ministry <coughs> itself, because Dr. Rafi is director of the, the planning and research division, the policy and, the, and research division. So, he will talk about the question of an inclusive and equitable education and also some points about the STEM education that we want to go further in the future. Okay, thank you. Transfer Chairman, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Very good morning, Islam Um First of all, I'd like to thank the organizer for inviting us, the MOE, to be together with you to discuss this very important uh, topic on national education and learning. Uh, and also, Tatiana uh, Zimak, since she, she already mentioned about the National Education Advisory Council with uh, Dr. Sadina and of course the three of the Deputy Chairman and the Secretary for the committee and therefore those things discussed in the committee will not be touched here. But however, uh, I would like to pick up from what uh, Tansri Dr. Omar mentioned just now about being a progressive, uh, prosperous, uh, harmony and, and sustainable. So probably I will touch on two things regarding this. On uh, The first one is on the SDG4, the Sustainable Development Goals. Uh, and secondly, other than on uh, STEM education that uh, Tan Sri has already uh, mentioned, uh, as, as we know, the SDG 4, uh, the goal is to ensure that inclusive and equitable quality education and promote lifelong learning opportunities uh, for all. And uh, the Ministry of Education has been doing that for so long. And with the new Malaysia, uh, there's a lot of uh, changes in, in policy and uh, approaches that we have uh, introduced so far uh, in order to provide that uh, equal uh, um, opportunity for quality education for all. Um, and secondly, I would touch a little bit on uh, the way of uh, how STEM is going about right now. Uh, that as you also as you mentioned about STEM education. And uh, I would probably share some of the um, What's going on uh, in the ground? On the ground right now, uh, what's happening in schools? Uh, is it so bad or is it changing? So some of the things that we have identified when we choose to um, to plan 
uh, under the National uh, Education Blueprint 2020 2025. Uh, we mentioned that we would like to have the six students' aspiration. And now is the fifth, six years of implementation. There's a lot of changes happening, and we are glad that the government continue to support the plan. And we are already uh, in the second wave of the education, Ablation Education Blueprint. So among others in the uh, Education Blueprint, we look at the uh, quality of teachers. This is one of the main components. We mentioned about providing the basic infrastructure, the curriculum, the assessment, and so on. But the people who are driving this change, the people who are delivering it, be it English or STEM education and so on, we need to prepare them to do their job and do their job well. Um, in order to do that, uh, along with the uh, SDG 4, it stated that in order uh, to achieve the goals stated in SDG 4, we need to provide relevant uh, teaching and learning methods Content that meets the needs of all learners, taught by well qualified, trained, adequately remunerated and motivated teachers, using appropriate pedagogical approaches, supported by appropriate ICT, and the creation of safe, healthy, gender responsive, inclusive, and adequately resourced environment that uh, facilitated uh, learning. So when we look at that, it's, it's very idealistic, and they know the challenges uh, that we are facing. When uh, that I mentioned that education without money, so it, it is a huge challenge for us. Uh, I would like to pick up from the, the stand. We are talking about um, the science lab in schools. Um, in our curriculum, uh, the practical aspect of STEM is practiced in school. Is the, the teachers when they teach science? be it uh, the uh, core science subjects or biology, physical, and chemistry, uh, it's a requirement to do the practical aspect. But when we change the policy from uh, not having the practical aspect tested in a national exam, people tend to move away from doing hands-on uh, the uh, experiments. And therefore, after uh, quite some time, more than uh, 12 years, without using that, uh, many of the labs were in very, very bad condition. And therefore, two years ago, we applied to the Ministry of uh, Finance for a special grant to fix all these uh, dilapidated uh, science labs. And that's been going on for the past two years, and this is the third year. Um, as Dati Lazima mentioned, uh, we are still um, running short of money to, to, to achieve what we want to do. However, uh, with the establishment of the National STEM Center uh, set up at the Ministry of Education, it is part of the national um, plan under the National Science Council, whereby the three main, main uh, ministries um, in STEM, the now MESPEC, last time was MOSPI, um, Ministry of Education and Ministry of Higher Education now become one. Uh, the National STEM Center is an agency that focuses uh, to look at STEM education from grassroots, from primary education, pre-primary and tertiary education. So having this team set up would help us to coordinate the effort in order to improve STEM education. And one of the things that they do in addition to looking at the uh, basic infrastructure of uh, our school labs, they are also proponents of new uh, approaches in uh, teaching and learning of science and mathematics. Therefore, one of the things that uh, as the, uh, Omar mentioned just now about inquiry-based science education and inquiry-based mathematics education. Um, this past two years, uh, it, we have been uh, doing a very extensive training program for our teachers to change the way we do things to change the approaches we do to teach science and mathematics. Um, and, and the input for this is not just from Academic Science Malaysia, from other ministries. We also look at the results from PISA and TIMS assessment. 
uh, when you mention about visa and teams, usually people will look at the ranking, where we are. But at the ministry level, it's not just the ranking. Uh, there's a lot of things that we learn from those international uh, assessments. For instance, the way we teach uh, science. We Now, if you look at our curriculum, we are not only focusing on the content, but looking at how they use the higher order thinking skills in approaching the content. Therefore, content is not the focus or the main attention in the classroom anymore. And this requires the change of delivering the, the content, the change in how we do um, the assessment. And in fact, um, this year will be the first year of Malaysia taking part in our regional uh, ASEAN uh, level international assessment. It's called Primary Learning Metrics. The 10 members of ASEAN will take but together in this uh, international benchmark, whereby the 10 uh, countries will, uh, we will look at the primary education, year five students uh, to take part in this assessment. And then from there, we can look at where we are lacking, where we are doing well, and where the uh, area where we need to improve. So there's a lot of things going on in our education system, and we are not alone. The Ministry of Education needs all the support that we can get from all the stakeholders involved. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Rabi. Many initiatives going on in, in the Ministry. Uh, we would now like to move on to uh, Professor Stephen Dauti on how foreign universities could fit into and contribute into the education system here. Thank you very much, uh, I think probably to answer that, that question, we'll be um, reflecting a little bit on uh, how did they in the old Malaysia, how will they or might they in the new Malaysia, and uh, within that discussion, thinking about foreign branch campuses in country, thinking about transnational education, and uh, thinking about Malaysia decide to be a, uh, an education hub. Um, just, just before I start, Perhaps uh, just reflecting on my, my own experience and kind of the institution that I've come from, um, which is RCSI and UCD, Malaysia campus. It's actually been in Malaysia for 20 odd years, we were established in 1986 as Pernod Medical College, and became Malaysia's 10th foreign branch campus, its first Irish one. And uh, slightly different from the other foreign branch campuses in uh, that it's transitioned from a college to a branch campus, where the others came in as new institutions. Uh, and it also has two institutions in its owner. So that, that sort of will perhaps uh, feed into a little bit about what I talk about. Um, old Malaysia versus new Malaysia, is there a, a different outlook towards uh, universities, towards higher education? Uh, I think there probably is. I think from my own experience, um, I've been in Malaysia since 2005, uh, so since that, that time, Parents and occasionally students would actually articulate quite clearly that some of their drivers about engaging with a foreign university in Malaysia were in order to get a good education and get out. That was uh, that, you know, people actually saying that's that's what their, their, their desire was. In, in the new Malaysia, I've certainly picked up a, a, a different uh, a different tone from students, a different tone. Well, particularly from the students, which is to get a good education and change the country for the better. So there seems to be a renewed optimism and, and uh, a renewed kind of engagement, which is, which is good. How does that affect trends in education and consumption? I think it's probably a little bit too early to tell. I know I asked my own institution and a number of others that I've spoken to observed a different pattern last year, during the year of the election, lead up to the election, after the election. Um, again, it will take a number of years, I think, for us to see whether, that, whether we're seeing a new pattern of, uh, of education consumption uh, or attitudes to education in, on the basis of new Malaysia. Uh, what does the policy and the governance landscape look like? And I'm going to talk specifically about universities here. Um, actually, it's probably very similar at the moment, um, and that's not necessarily a bad thing, because like a, a bit of continuity. 
If anything, the slight shift to being much slightly more liberal and open, Act 555 changes, although very, very minor and, and almost negligible, um, you know, that they are in place. But perhaps the big ones are things like the UUCA amendments um, and perhaps a different approach to students and who they are and what they can contribute. Um, but there are also still some increasing elements of control, some increasing elements of lack of autonomy, and I think those are things that we, we might discuss uh, a little bit. What about Malaysia as an educational hub? That was a vision under old Malaysia, still a vision as far as I know under new Malaysia. Uh, for those of you who aren't aware, a hub can be defined as a, a, a planned effort to build a critical mass of local and international actors strategically engaged in cross-border education, training, knowledge, production and innovation initiatives. That's from Jay Knight who defined that in 2011. Really aimed at an inward flow of students, but also uh, an ecosystem that permits an outward flow. But more than that, it's a hub that produces opportunities to receive international high quality education in country, and that's here in Malaysia now with the FUPCs and other uh, TNE activities. Uh, it's designed to support uh, education and also foreign investment in the country, and it, it kind of encourages policies uh, for long term engagement, uh, and exactly, branch campuses will be a good example of that. But also a mixed level of provision. That international activity has to be at the school level, at the TVET level, and, uh, and at the postgraduate and research level as well. Um, Malaysia has a, a long history of international engagement. Uh, first branch campuses, discussion starts in the 90s. Uh, twinnings occurred uh, even beforehand in the 80s. Um, lots of kind of good examples of some recent policy changes, last five, 10 years. Uh, equity ownership of foreign branch campuses can be wholly owned by the foreign uh, partner. Uh, but there will also be some less positive legislative changes. Um, in, uh, things like EMGS and uh, MPU subjects, those are the things that no doubt we could discuss in, for a very long time uh, that kind of cause problems for us in, in, uh, in uh, attracting international students to Malaysia. But as a whole, Malaysia is doing very well. 2% of international students' population around the world studying in Malaysia. Uh, the data is kind of the top 10 ish uh, for terms of intake uh, for international students and well on target for the, uh, the goal of getting international students into Malaysia. That's okay for inbound, but I think perhaps the evidence is a little bit more tricky for the outbound mobility, and we're we'll perhaps seeing a little bit of a decrease in that. So what do we need to see to ensure that Malaysia, the new Malaysia, uh, has a successful uh, hub for uh, education? We've got to improve the perceived attractiveness to international students. That's about providing high quality learning and living experience and ease of getting into the country. I think again, foreign universities could certainly help with the first part of that. I think we need the government help with the, the second part of that. Um, I think uh, removing protectionism from uh, the sector, uh, leveling the playing field, that's going to be important. Um, I think now the foreign university players that are in Malaysia have been here long enough now that they're, they're now no longer perceived as a threat and then hopefully perceived as, as partners and collaborators. Uh, certainly, you know, my time here, you know, I'm uh, collaborating with many, many uh, uh, researchers in, in Malaysia. Um, but I think there's still a bit of a challenge to create a, a, an ecosystem that's responsive and timely, uh, responsive in a timely manner rather to, um, to things that we as the sector need. So just a uh, closing thoughts then just on foreign branch campuses. My own institution, the driver for establishment, was really to provide opportunities for students to access high quality uh, in my case, international Irish medical education in Malaysia, uh, provided through an Irish style education, uh, but being locally embedded. So Irish is in origin, but locally embedded with international staff and international students. That, that driver is still the same in new Malaysia as it is in old Malaysia. Uh, I think the enablers for us to develop, the regulatory and the policy environment, that's just got to keep developing, so that's got to keep being enhanced. The things that we perceived as benefits for 
being a foreign university in Malaysia, internationalization at home, um, student pathways, transitions, international staffing, cultural engagement, lots of those things. Uh, those benefits are still here, if not, if not greater. Uh, the benefits to the governments are there, the benefits to the students are still there. So I guess in summary, I think New Malaysia does provide a renewed education landscape. I think foreign branch campuses and foreign transnational education is an important part of that landscape. Uh, that's both for inbound and for outbound students, uh, as well as in-country provision. Um, I think foreign universities will continue to be important for establishing Malaysia as an international hub, uh, whether that's TNE or in-country provision. And great progress has been made, but um, there is still a risk of stagnation if there isn't uh, attention paid to that policy and uh, the governance framework. And I think, again, that's probably a little bit about kind of what Data Peter was saying earlier as well. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for giving a perspective on uh, how foreign universities could come to Malaysia. I know there are many uh, in the private educational institutions who say that the field is getting crowded, uh, there's excessive competition. Uh, but on the other hand, Prof. out here said that with the injection of some foreign universities, you will lead to a, a, a bigger diversity of the offerings that we can uh, have here so that Malaysia will become this magnetic draw of the hub for, for higher education. We would now like to uh, complete the round of panelists' uh, presentations by asking a uh, YB Senator Yusmali Yusuf, uh, who actually interrupted his Devan Megara uh, speaking uh, obligations to come here, and then he will rush back to, to speak over there. And he will talk about education and its relevance to democracy and development. Why we? What else to speak, Nasri? <laughs> Thank you, Nasri. Terima kasih. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. First of all, I have to say I'm a accidental MP. I'm accidental senator, and today I'm accidentally here <laughs> because someone fixed me. His name is Dr. Tazri Mario. Thank you very much. It was weeks back, I was sitting next to him. We were talking about parliamentary reform, and he said, It's Mari, I'm free on this day. I said, I'm free. Can you come? Come for what? He said, National education. That's really, I'm not the right person. But, ladies and gentlemen, I don't know why. Again, accidentally, I'm sitting next to the right person who was talking about Stanford University. How does Stanford University be where they are today? Uh, well, accidentally, MP, 2008, I accidentally there in Palo Alto, 2014, I accidentally there, and I accidentally, today, brought the very same book written by the very same guy who turned around Stanford. And his name Professor Jack Casper, my dear professor. And in his inaugural speech, and what turned around Stanford to be what it is today, it is something which was said by all of the speakers, but in a different tone. And I think we may find it somewhere, what Tansi said, it must have to do something to do with our nation building, and I think we have to start as early as in our birth certificate. What is our nation's birth certificate? Our nation's birth certificate, Tansi, is a proclamation of independence. Somehow, somewhere there, he said this country has to be built based on democracy, justice, liberty, and of course, law. So today, I only have three points to say from the outset. Some people here may see education from the economic perspective. Some people may see education from the cultural perspective. But some may see education from purely utilitarian exercises for just another process. But I humbly would like to suggest under the new Malaysia, because this is a burden for me. I'm happy I'm not part of the consultative uh, committee. I'm happy uh, Azima was talking about we today. She was talking about we. I'm happy she's part of the process. Last time she has to fight outside. Now she's part of the uh, advisory member. I'm very happy. I'm very happy in that sense. That for me is uh, progress. And then I'm very happy today. Uh, the last part, Stephen used a very strong word. Actually, for me, it's autonomy. You used that word. And Tansi was talking about the NAC, uh, collaboration. Uh, because for me, what was said here, for me, this is what, at least for me to say in seven minutes, what is an education in the New Malaysia? Stanford University, by accident or by choice, by the founding father, chose the emblems or the motto called 
the winds of freedom blow. How freedom can make? Look at Stanford is not Ivy League like MIT, but somehow they are not Ivy League and now now top three. The reason I say this is this: good ideas, creativity, whatever you say, can only arise at a state of competence. Not at the state of contempt. If you are in the state of contempt, it's contemptuous. When I say contemptuous, it may be because of many reasons. Because of something not on merits, something can be uh, crime, something can be uh, whatever. I don't want to mention it, it can be easily associated with it. If that's blah blah blah. When you are in a state of competence, what will happen? You are talking about what will happen in the new Malaysia. At least you are talking about. Uh, Rafi have to create an ecosystem. It is, it, if it is policy, it's policy. If the law is a law, it is, uh, I would say, development is development. It has to be about collaboration of the core competence. Where all these things come from? I thought it's a new formula. It's not. It's a forgotten formula which developed this country for the last 60 years at least and, and developed this region to be the most stable region. Nothing great. In Davos, I'm part of thousands of young leaders, global shaper. We call ourselves the Un Davos. These are the expert of sign of spray. Yeah, people can we see there? People just go there for selfie. Why? If Davos doing something right, there will be no inequality problems now. If inequality become worse, until we can say, look here, let's talk about inequality. Come on, what's so great about it? Yes, culture is developing. Now we want to talk about IR 4.0. But what is so great about this country? At least I humbly submit as a young guy, kampung boy, balikulau boy. I tell you, uh, of course I said it, uh, it's full of conviction, I'm not at this stage. The young professor said, try to do something with Professor Osman Baka. This is the only place in the world where major civilization, correct me Stephen, where major civilization are interacting. The Muslim, the Indian, the Europeans, the Chinese, and the total effect of all this interaction, it has created the idea of modernity. And that idea of modernity for me somehow has managed to develop this country to be something that can be shared at the international level. You want to share about economy, we are a small country. You want to share about transparency, we are not. What more after the previous year, there's so many other problems. Uh, Dan Sri, you know, as a businessman, I don't know, you will put Royal Slamo or something to be proud of. Royal Slamo, I don't know, I don't know. You have been coming to some of you. We are talking about the world Islamic economy forum. I was not part of this, but someone was demonstrating how the investor will cheated. Okay. Why is it so here? I want to share, I have three points today. For me, education must be there, must have nexus to democracy. That is not, I said, John Lee said that years back. For me, number two, it has to be like what Tansi said, but I said in my own country, I've trained as a in the developmental, with the center that I'm attached to, Center for Democracy, the Rule of Law in Palo Alto, education must be a medium for delivering public goods. That's what Tansi said. But what is public goods? Certain places is property rights. Certain places is health. Certain places can be security. Lahat that is about security. You want to talk about property rights? No, it's about security. There are certain places like my Kampong in Balikula, it's property right. But then, can you imagine you have an academic institution has no relevancy to the social development around it? That's a big question. In fact, I did ask in my forum in Penang one time, I want the university to be closed. Because I know the university that you mentioned here, we said we are the farm, we are from the farm. But the farm turned around the whole farm, becomes Silicon Delhi. <laughs> we, are, we are from the farm. So, but when I asked Gahad Casper, how did we turn around the place? Then I went around the whole campus we see. He said, it's muddy, this may be from my point of view, the German origin, very strong Kantian, philosophical, whatever, whatever. I will make sure this campus where humanity and technology are equally important. Humanity. Then he will make sure something interesting as well. Simon, you have to do this. He made sure Rodan Gallery. Rodan Gallery, the real world. You know, sometimes, you know, most people, bonjour, I want to, 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 you know, to, 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 to. All right. It has to be development medium. Nexus to development must deliver public goods. In the previous years, public goods, you have an ambivalent society who cannot even stand tall, bold to talk about corruption. That's not education. At least it's not 
father will say, no, you know, it is, it is a curse to the society. Uh, education is not soul. Nila, Tawfa. Tansi quoted Ghana. Ghana is an educationist from uh, Harvard. He's another guy who wrote about how Harvard itself become a, an institution without soul. You know? <laughs> the sacred cow. Last point. At least uh, my accidental experience in Parliament, uh, 2008 2013, I've seen uh, how certain policy must have a strong access to rule of law. I give for example, I think roughly we know this. We we are not living in a very humane society if we cannot treat the minorities, can be the disabled, can be the our Iban Kadazan guy in uh, Sabah Sarawak to be the part of the education. I was I was in the discussion of Azana. Uh, remember when you come up the the profile research on education to be set, and they have a. I want to conclude this. Because the picture which was used for the Kazana report is a young, uh, a child, uh, is, a, is a daughter, young lady, ladies, uh, the children, uh, climbing up the ladders to strive for education. And then after everyone spoke, then I stood up and said, what happened if that lady or that daughter, is she's disabled? She may have to climb twice, harder. And then suddenly the friend of mine, so the economist, uh, you know him, the, the Chief of the Economic Advisor to the Prime Minister, is the boss of the I say, man, no, actually, I'm overlooked. Man. I overlooked the disabled. So I'm telling, I'm, I'm, I'm telling you what well, she said, uh, we have to be prosperous, we have to be Italian, but this food is going to. We have also to be humane. Well, education may enlighten us, enlighten is the fundamental justice, freedom, democracy. We must be able to be humane. So for me, education at very minimum must be about making us become gentlemen. How to respect it, you know, as we the ladies, the women until today in parliament, someone is using funny words uh, very slowly. As you said in Harimah, I'm still a uh, former uh, English lecturer, still fighting. Thank you, give me inspiration. The first thing she did, give me, you know, that's it. The first thing she met me, you must see my father, my brother. So what is it? <laughs> then when I read, of course, he's a dedicated person. So I have something to learn. So Tansi, thank you for this opportunity. But for the first round, what I say, I have three points for you. Education under the new Malaysia must have nexus to democracy. And I think freedom is about the freedom of the someone like Stephen who runs the university, freedom to the faculty, the professors, and freedom to the students. Now you're a student marching to parliament. I, for me, I cannot. If the total effect of so-called the financial assistance to students just create another billion dollars of debt, that's a not good policy. What's so great about it? You just get someone to pay them more than a thousand years to get that character. No, it's wrong. Because access to education is what the way I was taught country is human right. Access to education for information is human rights. It is not just another commercial exercises. Last point, another second point, and three, it has to have an access to developmental. When I say developmental, it's not building construction. It's not to UCSI must be the, the, the conscience or the common form of trust. It must have a spillover effect to that. The USM must have a spillover effect to Balikula or the island. If it doesn't have that effect, what is that? So the last point, we must have also, at least I see in Malaysia for the last 60 years, must have intervention of rule of law. Meaning, if until today you still have, uh, I give for example, I have to say to my daughter is down syndrome, I start learning the law is not in order, the policy is not in order, the support system is not in order. So I have to say we must have law. Say for example, there are so many options of law. You choose it. You want to have, like Obama did, uh, but they no one left behind. You want to have uh, the, the inclusive model of any North Korea. There are so many options. But the challenge that I say is the only place in the world where major civilizations are interacting. Uh, the total effect only has developed the country to certain idea of modern, uh, modernity, and that is intellectualism. I think we have a chance to be the new center of gravity in the world, and inshallah, with all your support, as I said, collaboration of the core competent will give new synergy for the higher purpose of the country, and I think uh, that's what I meant by education in the new Malaysia. Salam alaikum. Thank you. Thank you. But a Polish politician, <laughs> but lawyer who is able to speak so eloquently about all the key matters uh, that is uh, so key to this question of education. I, I realize we are running very late, but maybe at least one burning question which somebody wants to, uh, to speak, or we have at least a quick 
Ich mache mal ab. Please address your name and who, whoever you address the question to, and others can also chip in. Okay. Hi, my name is uh, Karma, and uh, I'm the only in our class. Um, so my questions are directed to uh, to Latin Asma and also to Dr. Rafi. Uh, it's these two questions. I agree with Sensei Yusufani that education is the nexus of democracy. And I think that with the suggestion by the government to lower the age of voting in Malaysia, we need a radical or a major rethink of how we educate students to prepare them to become future voters and to prepare them for this involvement in the democracy. So first question is, what are the policies that uh, the MOE uh, are planning to implement to help to improve citizenship education or political education among students? And second is very much related to the idea uh, by Sensitive Money about autonomy. Uh, in developed countries, they decentralize education. So um, in my experience, was in, in, uh, in America, where they allow various stakeholders, for example, CSOs and NGOs, to interact with students and run programs. So currently, it's, it's very difficult for CSOs and NGOs to be involved and, uh, and, and speak to students directly. How can we improve this process, or how can we involve various stakeholders in the education of our Malaysian students? So those are the questions. Thank you very much. Okay. Katina Zimbabwe's. Dr. Rabi. Okay, I'll try to answer your question. First of all, um, the blueprint had recommended that um, uh, higher order thinking skills um, be emphasized in schools. So the target was that when children have tests or assessments, 50% of the, what they are being assessed are related to um, HOTS. But unfortunately, I think we've met only 25% of that target. You know, so, and I think that also it's important that um, children realize that uh, it is in, that thinking is is something that needs to be done, and uh, you know that um, reading has to be inculcated. That reading culture, unfortunately, we lost along the way, and we have to bring that back. And we cannot rely on teachers. Parents have to play a role in bring back the reading culture, and the reading. The, you know, your breadth of knowledge um, increases, your uh, thinking skills increases because there's so much more to read. And also, more importantly, why we are pressing for English is because when you are proficient in English, you tend to read English books and that's where really, especially, the knowledge of science, uh, you know, is in there. So, um, so again, thinking skills, reading culture, and I think um, uh, we've moved away from the third mentality. So if students come out of schools reading and thinking, I think we will achieve what you what you want. Thank you, uh, Dr. Can I add a Okay, a little bit more on the uh, on autonomy and uh, lowering the issue of uh, voting. Okay, uh, as the senator, when, when the senator mentioned about autonomy, you know that uh, with autonomy also comes responsibility. And uh, the sense of responsibility and uh, citizenship is part of the curriculum where uh, civic education is coming back. And within that uh, curriculum, there is a component on uh, citizenship uh, education. In addition to that, we also have uh, introduced the um, United Nations model whereby uh, children in schools already um, role-play the similar things we do at, at the United Nation. Uh, and also, uh, recently, uh, we have already launched a program uh, called in schools, whereby uh, literacy on uh, the uh, legal system of Malaysia will be introduced and as a part of the curriculum and as well as the co-curriculum in schools. So those are some of the examples of the changes going uh, to our schools. Thank you. Thank you. And with regards to your question about citizenship, because of the lowering of the age to a voting age to 18, I think you've also heard announcements that the minister is thinking of uh, having a series of what we call discussions on civics and citizenship. And I think in those uh, which they're developing, it will soon be apparent that topics like this, you know, of citizenship, constitutional monarchy. All these issues will 
brought into the school curriculum so that our students know how to exercise their vote when they reach the age of 18. All right, please. I think we'll have after this one more and then we have to close the session for the next one. Please, please. Good afternoon. Hello, analysts and audience. My name is Sarah from Teaching Accounting for Salin Chat Accounting in UITM. I would like to ask Professor Stephen Doty, as a non-Malaysian, from your observation, the changes and the information of Malaysian education from your point of view, Start from when? Uh, uh, you, because I noticed that you, um, you mentioned year 2005, so I would like you to um, clarify uh, when did you notice that the revolution uh, take place. And another thing, um, I would like to ask you what do you understand by new mission? Okay, so that uh, our understanding. Okay, um, be more objective, objective. Okay, so that uh, I'm not understand uh, other other than what you meant. Okay. And um, one more thing, uh, I would like to comment about, uh, about the uh, civic study, right? Because um, um, like uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure whether it is. Warren Buffet or Betty talk about integrity. Okay, so what we did, I think the the definition is some sort like doing something when nobody, no, doing right thing when nobody, nobody is watching. Alright, um, like um, like for like for like for like for me, okay, as a Muslim, alright, doing right thing, um, not just. Solely based on nobody watching, but actually it, 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 we are being uh, accountable because ev everything that we did, that we do, okay, being recorded. Okay, so um, when uh, you comment, okay, um, uh, that thing about uh, the stoning and the effect of the uh, young young kids, you are you are you are coming, com commenting on. Uh, the Sharia, right? Uh, uh, and did you notice that uh, what as uh, level of exposure uh, the young kids uh, face uh, nowadays? Even the cartoon, Ubin, Ipin, the uh, the the robots, the superheroes, okay, the level of violence, and uh, the kissing, kissing, sing, right? The uh, the, uh, the, the, the 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 stoning that you mentioned, this it did it, it not um, uh, visual uh, vi uh, show in, visualize like uh, those in uh, motion 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 pictures, but um, it is uh, uh, what exactly is your question? Please, we have yeah, okay. to Professor Dowdy, right? Alright, okay. Uh, yeah, because we have to. Okay, okay, okay. 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 I am going that. I am going that. Okay. Uh, my question is, uh, when you talk about the uh, the civic. Uh, what uh, studies? I think uh, it is not uh, uh, just uh, this, this is not the, a new idea because during my uh, primary uh, education it, it, it already been implemented. So uh, I think uh, that is my opinion. Okay. Thank you. All right, thank you. Yes, Prof. Yes, just quickly. I think I'm on the first half of that. But anyway, uh, yeah. So in terms of my definition of New Malaysia, uh, I was taking the, um, the the broad newspaper terminology, um, media terminology of New Malaysia being uh, as since the uh, the election of, uh, of last year. And, and I think in terms of when did I see that kind of transition, it was around that time. Yeah. So that there was uh, people seemed to have a, a renewed optimism from. The, the kind of impact I was having with the students or the interactions with the students. Uh, more broadly, from my experience since 2005, um, you know, I have witnessed variations in different policies uh, being implemented within the education system, and then as a, as a higher education uh, 
So it's just the, the, the feeling that comes through. Uh, again, then, that, that Peter might have a, a word or two on this as well. Um, you know, there was a definite impact when, as the as the flow through from teaching science uh, in, in Bath, teaching science in English, you know, that transition was felt, uh, particularly in an institution like ours where we where we teach in English. Um, you know, that was a there was noticeable uh, impact there. So, so I'm not sure that was your question, but, but what I will say is, you know, I, you know, as an outsider, as it were, uh, though I, my kids feel they're more Malaysians than British, um, then, you know, they're, they're actually, you know, we can observe some of these effects come through and some of these kind of societal impacts. Uh, I'm not sure, and just on that, just a very quick one, you know, my kids have kind of like a cultural integration of 40 years in Malaysia has probably benefited more than their education. And I think maybe some of that civic question kind of rolls into that, but I'm not sure the civic question was addressed to me. Okay, thank you. But we can do that during lunchtime, I think any other queries. But we have to end with the last one, it's been standing very patiently, quickly, a quick point or question. Uh, thank you, uh, Thank you. Hello. Uh, a very good morning to uh, all. I mean, first and foremost, thank you very much for the panel. I think what has been discussed is really, really good. I'm Khalid. I'm uh, currently an associate professor at Harriet Watt University, Malaysia. I'm also here to represent some of my colleagues from Society of Engineering Education, Malaysia. Yeah, listening to the panel discussion, I mean, I tried to make a conclusion because I was really taking a lot of notes. So it's actually most of the discussion is based on two key points. First, you know, really emphasizing on delivering the knowledge, either from the school level up to the university, either in STEM or non social science uh, streams. I mean, the delivery of teaching is actually one of the key points being discussed. And the other part, taking from country uh, slogan, the education has to be actually delivering prosperity, harmony, uh, progressive and sustainable, and also being uh, emphasized by YB Senator in terms of humanity and stuff. I was thinking about that is all the well-being component and resilient among the youth that has to be inculcated together with the delivery of education. Yeah. So in that sense. Basically, what we have been discussing so far is about positive education where actually we need to build up the character and the well-being of the student, remembering the youth nowadays having a lot of stress. The okay, so of your question is, please. My your question, question is, to the right person. how does that, I actually it can be a YB, uh, the YB or Pansri or Datin Halima, uh, uh, sorry, uh, I'm, I'm sorry about the name. Yeah. Uh, how does this positive education is actually going to be implemented uh, from the very, very low level of education up to the university level? Is that actually what the new Malaysia direction of education? Thank you. Okay, maybe you represent the three of us. No, that's a very good because we, answering it really is a serious question, very good question coming from an academician. For me, education in Malaysia is not by default. We started, we have Al-Quran Raza, we have uh, Rahman Talib, all these attacks to a very strong, clear, normative thinking, well thought. But of course, along the way, there are so many challenges, challenges, distractions. But of course, what I'm trying to tell you is that if you go through to that uh, 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 ideals of uh, our uh, shared destiny, document. I think it's clear about Shasia. Of course, that's why I don't want to say here about what Iman al said about education, about what somebody did. Because it is there, because somehow that's how we endeavor. So for me, uh, that's uh, someone like Nansri who, who see how that idea, that normative idea, being implemented. I use the word situational aid, circumstances. Because I don't have that privilege. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, I don't have that privilege. But in New Malaysia, I have to say this. I would love to see what Tan Sri said, collaborations on the core competence. Yeah. The moment the core competence start collaborating, yeah. not who said to me, Tan Sri, it was said to me by President Kala in Singapore in his paper called Confluence of Civilization. Yeah. Why he can create that, that very scientific? 
because you want instructor by Rajiv Gandhi as a top scientist from India, go and call competent from India, go and collaborate with the core competent scientists from Russia. So for me, a moment the ecosystem created is about collaboration with the core competent for the higher purpose of the the country. Inshallah, with Ismila, we'll achieve something. We we'll end up somewhere. I think uh, there are two, for me, there are two uh, important things uh, for our education looking into the future. Number one, back to harmony. Without harmony, without unity and harmony, there is no future at all. So that is a very, very critical thing. And as I said, the components to teach unity and harmony need not necessarily be in the form of, form of teaching. It can be done in so many other ways. The second one is everybody is concerned about your future jobs. The saying is, your future is not going to be what it used to be. So the job in the future is not to be whatever it used to be. So this is another concern. So how do you prepare? You cannot build the future, but you can you cannot build the future that you want, but you can build your, you can you can train your, your young people to be ready for the future. And this is where uh, about, uh, the way you think, the way uh, your, your ability to link with people, your ability to co to collaborate. Your critical thinking, this is, this is a very important soft skill that needs to be, uh, to be incorporated. How do you do that? This is a big question. This is where the whole thinking needs to be done. The whole education system has got to be done. Uh, Inquiry based uh, learning is one, which is STEM. But STEM was, was, uh, was built on the American system. And they say about uh, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. If I, if I <coughs> am a doctor, I say, why engineering and not, and not medicine? Why not other discipline? Engineering there is the, is the system of thinking, the logical system of thinking, which can be taken care of by, by the scientific method, actually. So for me, if you want to use STEM, E should be English, because that's the way you, you link with, uh, with the rest of the world. Or if you want to still use engineers, my engineering friends can AI I am engineer, I want engineering in there. S T double E. So engineering and English and mathematics. This is <laughs> the back of the Thank you. Thank you. As you can see, you know, uh, whether it is a STEM or English or a global community, that's a common thread. And when uh, why we ask, you know, what is the nexus of education? Of course, we have different links. We do have to democracy. Someone asked about link to become better citizens, to vote at the age of 18. And in the final analysis, it will always be back also to the parents and your own child. What is it that you wish for your own child, your children to become? And I think whether they be gainfully employed, whether they have the right uh, attitude and knowledge to, to fit into jobs which haven't existed. I think all these are issues flowing around us and I, I'm sure we can keep on going but I'm being reminded that time is up. I have to end this very uh, uh, interesting uh, series of talks by our distinguished panelists. So with this, I would like to ask you all to please join me in thanking them. For the